what's in a day? For over 600 people worldwide, every single day, it's death by drowning. This need not be our future. The United Nations has agreed a historic resolution. July 25th is World Drowning Prevention Day. We can prevent this silent killer through awareness, education, supervision, training, and emergency preparedness. A day to remember loved ones lost. A day we can all mark by practicing water safety in everything we do. Make it your day one. Together, let's bring our drownings down for good. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Justin Scar. Um, I have a range of roles, actually. I'm, I'm with the ILS. I'm the Drowning Prevention Commission Chair. I'm also the CEO of Royal Life Saving Society Australia, and I'm your facilitator for this morning, this evening, this afternoon, wherever you are across the world. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of uh, the land on which I'm sitting tonight, the Gamaragal people, and then I, I honour their elders past, present and future. Um, we've got a fantastic, exciting program this evening, um, <laughs> this morning, this afternoon. Um, it's a program that honours uh, the World Drowning Prevention Day and many of the celebrations that occurred across the globe just on Sunday. Um, it's also a, a program that uh, focuses on some of the high level impacts that have been going on uh, leading up to the UN resolution and hopefully looking forward into the next couple of years. And we've also got a really exciting debate in the middle where we'll talk a little bit about, uh, more about what implementation might look like in some of the regions where we need to work hardest. Um, I'd like to start this evening by encouraging you to use the chat to introduce yourselves and, uh, and post questions. We'll do our best to interact with those questions as we progress through uh, the webinar. Um, and um, uh, we certainly encourage you to do that. There'll also be some people, some colleagues of, of ours who will be dropping in links for you that might link to a, a website or some research or a particular video that we're talking about. So I'd encourage you to, uh, to enjoy, have fun. There's a lot of people that have worked very hard to put this webinar together uh, today. Um, so uh, without further ado, it's a, been a great honour to be invited to facilitate the, the webinar and to work with a great team to put it together. Um, but let's start with probably our most important person this evening. Let's, uh, let's now watch a video presentation from Dr Tedros, the World Health Organisation Director General. Please join us in supporting World Drowning Prevention Day. Drowning is among the 10 leading cause of death for children worldwide. Over 90% of all drowning deaths occur in low and middle income countries. The tragedy is that these are preventable deaths. That's why Bangladesh and Ireland joined by 79 other countries have adopted the first ever UN General Assembly resolution on global drowning prevention. The resolution calls on governments to develop drowning prevention programming in line with World Health Organization recommended interventions. We need the support of governments, civil society, academia, and the media to keep the spotlight on this preventable cause of death. Working together, we can build a healthier and safer world for all. I thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Tedros. Um, I'd like to invite to the panel now uh, our first uh, panellist. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Meddings. Uh, Dr. David Meddings is from the World Health Organization in Geneva, where he coordinates the department's work in response to child injury prevention, burns and drowning, and also falls prevention. He also coordinates the WHO's capacity building and policy development area. So welcome, David. Thanks, Dr. Justin. Very good. So Dr. Tedros uh, did a fantastic introduction and framing of the issue this evening. It was a video that he recorded and I believe it was shared uh, across the globe on, on Twitter uh, and in various other channels. Um, can you start by just explaining to us um, the significance of the resolution and also uh, WHO's work leading up to the resolution? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there, there's a lot of really positive things about this resolution, but I'll just quickly mention two aspects that I think are, are really great. The first is it, there's a political dimension to, to this resolution, and that's, that's important because it gives us a platform as a UN organization to, to do certain things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Uh, so that's a, that's a very critical part of it. The other aspect that I think is really useful for this entire field, and I'm, I'm just really very happy to see such a big turnout in the, in the number of participants we have on this, this webinar, is this resolution gives us a, a unifying framework. So no matter whether you consider yourself first and foremost a lifesaver working in a national life-saving association, or if you're, you know, somebody who's who's been working on child health or rural development, or even if you're a disaster risk management person, this resolution gives us all a unifying framework from which we can uh, leverage the, the power and the strength of, of many. Um, and I think the the if I can call it this, the the slogan that we picked this year, um, anyone can drown, no one should, uh, is it's got a timeless quality to it that's relevant no matter what what sector you come from uh, and i think that's the other big big thing that this resolution gives us a unifying platform to to come together around this and and uh dr Menix, can i ask you of all the things you've done in the last 10 years from a who perspective what do you think's had the greatest impact on getting us to this point boy that that's really hard i don't i I couldn't give you a single thing because uh, I don't believe that it ever is. I, I, I think it's uh, it's a combination of a lot of things along the way. I think if I had to you know, look to one single thing that I think has been most useful in allowing me to move the issue in some way, it has been um, that I've not been alone. I, I feel very strongly that I've had a lot of support and a lot of help from people who I consider friends now um, within the drowning prevention community because without that, uh, I'm a single guy working at WHO. I don't have anybody else working with me and I cover a lot of issues. So it just wouldn't be possible to do um, whatever WHO has done without the help and support of the people in, in this very community. So that's the biggest success as far as I'm concerned. Okay, well, that's a that's a bigger picture answer and very diplomatic of you. I think there's lots of people on the um, on the webinar tonight that might reflect on the, the global report on drowning and the impact that that had for the sector and of course there's the implementation guide and there's a range of resources that um, people in the field now can utilize to to advocate so um, a congratulations on behalf of all of us for all of your work um, but what we'd like to do now uh, David is just have a quick look at the video uh, this is a video presentation from UNICEF it's the executive director Henrietta Ford every year an estimated 96,000 children lose their lives to drowning that is more than 260 children every day. In some countries, drowning is among the top causes of death for children. UNICEF believes that we can prevent this through early flood warnings and response, through information and education, and by supporting basic swimming skills and water safety training for every child. We are working with communities and partners around the world to deliver these life-saving programs. On this World Drowning Prevention Day, let us shine a light on this important issue and let us join forces to make sure that more children and more families in every country are saved from these preventable tragedies. Yeah, thanks very much to, to Henrietta Four there for that, uh, that video. It was lovely to see all of that um, Bangladesh content there, some very familiar photos, David. Um, David, can you just, um, uh, just sort of give us a sense of the importance of UNICEF going forward? Well, yeah, I, I mean, UNICEF has to be uh, recognized as, as really the, the pioneer UN organization that very much kick-started work on drowning prevention. They they made possible some of the most uh, formative work on drowning prevention research by, by funding these programs in, in Bangladesh. Um, those programs got off to a strong methodologically rigorous start. I know they were, they were greatly assisted by, by some other external stakeholders, but that, that, the importance of that early work by UNICEF just, just cannot be underestimated. It's laid the basis for 
um, a good deal of, of the evidence-based uh, uh, material that we turn to that, that provides us with, uh, with the strength to recommend things like basic swimming skills and, and, and water safety skills or, or daycare for children to assure adult supervision. So I'm very, very happy that UNICEF is coming in a way back into the, the drowning prevention fold. And I, I see that as a really, really positive positive development because they've, they've been away a little bit for, for a while, but this looks like they've they put it back now on their radar. And that's, that's a great thing. Yeah, there was certain, certainly some synergy in the UN resolution um, being proposed by Bangladesh um, and, and, and the, the, the journey that Bangladesh has had over the last couple of decades in, in helping us understand drowning prevention in a, a low and middle income context. So I thought that was, yeah. um, that was really good. Now, another imp really important group um, now is um, Bloomberg Philanthropy. So we'd just like to introduce a video presentation from Michael Bloomberg, the founder of Bloomberg Philanthropies. Let's watch his video. Earlier this year, the UN passed a resolution recognizing July 25th as the inaugural World Drowning Prevention Day. It is dedicated to those who have died of drowning, and it calls on governments and other organizations to take action. Drowning is a major global cause of death, particularly for children. It has killed more than 2.5 million people over the past decade, and the toll is heaviest in low and middle income countries. At Bloomberg Philanthropies, we've been supporting drowning prevention efforts since 2012, but much more needs to be done. We strongly support the UN's call for countries to develop drowning prevention programs in line with recommendations from the World Health Organization. These interventions are urgently needed because Drowning Prevention Day reminds us of the cost of inaction and the potential for real life-saving change. Together, we can make progress. I hope you'll join us. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Bloomberg. Um, I'd like to now introduce uh, Rebecca Babinger from Bloomberg Philanthropies in New York. Um, Becky Babinger works in the public health team at Bloomberg Philanthropies, where she manages grants within the initiative for, uh, to reduce global tobacco use, the initiative for global road safety, maternal and reproductive health program, and of course, the initiative for, to prevent drowning. So welcome, welcome, Rebecca. Thank you, Justin. Lovely and thank you, you've joined us so early in the morning over there. Oh, it's fine. Thank you so much for organizing this, for having Bloomberg Philanthropies part of the webinar today. Well, wow, you're very, very welcome. Um, so um, as we've seen in your introduction there, um, Bloomberg Philanthropies does so much across a broad portfolio of program. Can I ask you what attracted Bloomberg Philanthropies to uh, drowning prevention? And, and what do you see as some of your biggest impacts today? So we have a criteria when we look at our global health portfolio in terms of what we should be investing in. And number one is the highest burden. So we're looking at global causes of mortality and morbidity across the world. And unfortunately, drowning remains one of the largest killers. Um, you know, with the new estimates, it still is 236,000 deaths every year. Most of those in low and, income, low and middle income countries. We also want to invest in areas that have proven interventions. We were very fortunate, as Mike Bloomberg said, to start investing in 2012 with a study in Bangladesh to test two interventions to prevent drowning among children. And we found that providing community daycare reduced drowning risk by 88% among the enrolled children. So we knew what works. We have other evidence from WHO on what works and we're trying to scale that around the world. We also like to invest in areas where there are very few funders. Unfortunately, drowning is one of those public health areas that does not have a lot of funding right now from either private foundations or from governments. So we know that our investment can have a real impact. And then finally, Mike Bloomberg likes to say, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And thankfully with strong evaluation partners, we are able to measure our impact and show to the governments what even a little funding can do to save lives. And then Justin, in terms of our impact, we really see our role as private philanthropy in showing what's possible, in piloting programs, in trying to convince governments of their impact so that they can scale them across the country. We've been proud to support up to 50,000 children in community daycare in Bangladesh. And Bangladesh is in the process of adopting a national policy to prevent drowning 
which would include continuing those community daycares and expanding them across the country. We've also been investing in Vietnam, working with the Molisa Agency, the national government agency in Vietnam, to provide survival swim instruction for 14,000 children. And due to the pandemic, we had to stop the instruction, but as soon as it's safe, we'll continue to provide that instruction and the government is hopefully going to take that on and scale it across the country. And then finally, we were able to produce a report about the demographics and circumstances of drowning in Uganda. And we'd like to work with the government to develop a program in Uganda that could address the target um, audience in terms of who makes up the largest burden of drowning deaths in Uganda. So really for us, the impact is when governments invest. And so we're tracking that and we're supporting them along the way. Right. Well, thank you very much. It's lovely to have you in the webinar and also lovely to have you in, in drowning prevention, of course. Um, let me now introduce uh, Gemma May from the Royal National Lifeboat Institution in Poole. Uh, Gemma is the advocacy manager for RNLI's international team. Gemma works with colleagues and she does some fantastic things uh, with the UN agencies and governments. And she's also the secretariat for the, or one of the secretariat for the group of friends of drowning prevention that have been working on the UN resolution. So welcome, Gemma. Hi, Justin. Thank you for having us. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone. Um, there's 230 odd people. We were hoping to get to 500. So hopefully some of those other people that registered will join us very, very shortly. Um, but listen, it's great, really great to have you and a really exciting time for you and your team. Um, I guess the first question um, that we've got for you is around the group of friends and, and what, what, what was the importance of the group of friends and what might be their role going forward? Thanks, Justin. It's incredibly important um, to have that mechanism. It's a trusted route. Uh, we focus the resolution um, on behalf of the community on, on securing that from the UN General Assembly, as, as many of you know. The Group of Friends is, is a way that co countries are represented by their missions, their ambassadors who, who work to monitor and advance progress on the sustainable development goals, on poverty, on conflict, those kinds of things on behalf of their governments, coalesce around issues to create change, whether that's through um, monitoring progress on particular activities or taking action on, on new areas. And when we look back through history, um, when we've seen change on neglected issues, whether that was on HIV and AIDS, malaria, TB, uh, road safety, then uh, many of these activities have commenced through example, through a res resolution and a, and a coalition of countries who have been the voice um, and that group of friends has been uh, uh, focused on a, a very core group of countries that have both, both have um, high burden so, uh, of, of drowning prevention, but also those that have made progress. So really at the heart of that were the nations of Bangladesh, Vietnam, Thailand, Fiji, and of course, Ireland. And Bangladesh and Ireland, as we've noted, you know, have, have taken that um, forward and proposed it and, and got unanimous support across, the, uh, across the, the entire, uh, all member states. Now, that group worked hard over two years. Um, I would say to everybody here, there were over 130 countries actively involved, whether that was formally proposing, um, co-sponsoring, actively participation in all rounds of negotiations leading us to this point of adoption. Um, and so that kind of, um, that, that, that energy, if you will, and uh, the, the confidence and support for this issue when nobody had ever thought about talking to them about it before and the resonance with the agendas that we all share and that they have all committed to, action on the SDGs, action on climate change, action on preparedness for disaster risk reduction, action on universal health coverage, seeing where drowning prevention fits that fits those agendas, which they've all signed up to, is really, really important. A group of friends um, is looking to continue. It sees its work as just starting. Um, I would like to really give the opportunity to, to this group of uh, this audience to, to signal already that um, the group isn't going away. They see their role in New York as incredibly important uh, as monitoring progress and accountability on this. Uh, we're taking some time to regroup and reflect a little bit on the evolution of the group. As I said, there's that, at the heart of it was around 15 countries um, with the incredible support um, to get the resolution over the line. It's expected to expand. 
from the leadership group of Ireland and Bangladesh, they are very much going to be at the heart of driving this evolution forward and helping us to monitor progress and change. Um, and if we look at the resolution itself, uh, operative text on page three, uh, those list of items that David's called out about national plans, about um, investment uh, for activities, proven intervention, sharing lessons learned and research, they're actually an incredibly helpful checklist, an informal checklist, if you will, to serve as a benchmark uh, for monitoring progress. Um, and so uh, it'll be possible to really, you know, uh, several years from now, and we can actually you know, be able to report a year from now, um, What's the, what's the change that we're starting to see? So I think to reassure uh, listeners that the group remains, they're ready to take this forward further. And um, in addition, the resolution itself acts as a really helpful baseline monitoring tool. Um, and to really, uh, I think to really be excited and enthused and offer the audience real sort of hopeful and positive energy that uh, there really are a committed uh, group of individuals and institutions behind this. We've seen some of them already, of course, uh, WHO here hosting this and named clearly in the, in the resolution, but also UN family members, uh, UNICEF specifically. They've been at the heart of the resolution process as well. And um, the, 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 uh, the support that uh, Henrietta Four offers us, the ED, uh, about their, uh, their contributions going forward, I think is um, incredibly helpful. Thanks, uh, thanks, Gemma. Uh, very, uh, let's let's go to David and let's see if we can um, uh, ask one question to each of the panelists to, to move us forward in terms of discussion. Um, David, what do you see as the priorities for the field uh, in terms of keeping this issue moving forward? Engaging other sectors, like uh, you know, in a nutshell, that's it. This is and the the resolution is going to give us a great platform to to do that. I think. What the, what the issue needs to really expand now is to engage people who will not have previously seen their, their work or their job as having something to do with, with drowning prevention. But I'm, I'm quite confident that we can, we can get through to uh, people working in sectors as, as diverse as fisheries or maritime safety or, or child or rural development and show them that there are synergistic benefits to what they are doing and drowning prevention and, and making them aware that without necessarily changing much about what they do, but perhaps changing a little bit about how they do it, uh, they can also contribute to, to bringing drowning uh, deaths down worldwide. So connecting with other sectors is, is for me the biggest uh, next gen priority. Yeah, I had someone say to me the other day that we've just got to make friends, make 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 lots of friends yeah. and expand yeah. the, the family. So good, good. Thank you. And how about you, Becky? What do you see as the big priorities moving forward? Thanks, Justin. Well, first, I need to say that we really owe a lot of um, gratitude to RNLI for continuing the drumbeat and to um, bring together the group of friends. Bloomberg Philanthropies was really pleased to to host a meeting back in May 2017 with RNLI support. And we see that as our role moving forward is to really continue advocating to governments to take up this issue, prioritize it, um, develop water safety strategies, national plans and fund them. Um, and so we see that as our roles to really continue to push governments to prioritize this. And thanks to RNLI for, for uh, bringing us into the cause. Thanks, Becky. And, and how about you, Gemma? What's, uh, what's your priorities moving forward? I think there are a couple. It's in incredible. We've made great progress um, around, around technical interventions, uh, WHO's uh, advice and guidance on, 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 on those areas as well. But I think there are some gaps as well uh, that we know, and some of that's very pertinent to now. I think we have to have a really strong, clear narrative around the relevance and interlinkages between drought prevention and climate change. I mean, if ever we were going to see that, it's in the last few weeks and months, wherever you are, whether you're in Europe, whether you're in India, China, Bangladesh, um, it's really, really important. And I know that there are a number of colleagues here and elsewhere who are starting that narrative, but it's really essential. We have to show relevance and opportunity, and that in turn um, affects investment. There are a significant amount of investment in climate uh, finance. Um, and uh, I would really like to see um, really clear examples of where drowning prevention is included in uh, community resilience programs, 
um, as an element of, of many things for preparedness, I think we can do it. And when we start to signal that, it will really help open people's eyes up and make the links. Also, I'd really like to call out perhaps um, the economic case for drowning prevention, both um, the opportunity cost and the opportunity lost if we don't, uh, we don't take action. There has been work done on, on that question um, some years ago, but I would like to say that we really need to revisit it. And again, we need to make it stronger because if we want national governments to take action, they need to understand how much it's gonna cost, how, how beneficial it is to, make, to take preventative action um, and to know how it all works in their system, whether that's you know, at the highest level, national budgets or more locally, um, as well as of course, really looking at the detail of, of interventions. What do they cost? What are the benefits they bring? And I think if we can nail that, then uh, that will be fantastic and really, really essential to major scale up and growth. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jim. It says there's some uh, some momentum building from David's partner with sectors through Becky's really strong call to action to let's focus on governments and get gov get governments moving. And then Gemma, some of um, some of the entry points in terms of getting governments moving have been out really out well outlined by you. Um, David, any final comments for you before we move on to the next section? No, oh, maybe just just I'll profit to throw out a, a big thank you to everybody that's uh, that's on this webinar because there it's been really inspiring to see so much great work over the weekend. So great job done, everybody. Really, really happy to have seen it turn out the way that it did. Thank, thank you, David. Um, we're going to uh, and and actually thank you, thank you, Becky as well, and thank you, Gemma. Just looking at the time, uh, Gemma, we're going to play the the video, the R and Alive video, but we probably don't have time to discuss it. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll play that now. Um, sorry, I'll say goodbye to everyone, and then we'll play the video, and then we'll move on to that next session so that we can keep to time. So thank you very much, Gemma. Thank you, Becky, and thank you, David. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. I thought that was a, a nice video to end that session in. And, and certainly there's lots of people in the, in the webinar this evening from RNLI. So on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank RNLI for their significant contribution. And the significance of that video, I know everyone in, in the UK at the moment understands the importance of some of the messaging behind that video. And I certainly congratulate RNLI across the UK and Ireland for some of the work they're doing domestically as well. And we're going to move now to the, the next part of our webinar, it's a, it's a new session. Um, this session is gonna focus on the regional context priorities and multi-sector sectoral action. Uh, we have three wonderful speakers um, in this section. And um, I'd like to start by introducing the first of those speakers. Um, the first speaker is uh, Professor Olive Kuzabangi from Makarei University in Kampala. Um, Professor Olive is a surgeon and injury epidemiologist. She is a senior research fellow at the University uh, School of Public Health, where she heads the Trauma Injury Disability Unit. Um, and she's also a, a distinguished fellow at the George Institute. So very fine. Welcome to you, Professor Kuzabangi. Kobasinghi, sorry. I'm always, I always do that badly, Olive. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Um, and now I'd like to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Carolyn Lukasik from the World Health Organization, Western Pacific region in Manila. Dr. Lukasik is a technical officer for preventing violence, injuries and harmful alcohol use. 
in the Western Pacific Regional Office of WHO, and she's a public health researcher and an injury epidemiologist in her spare time. So welcome to you, Dr. Lukasik. Thank you. And our next speaker is Dr. Jagnor Jagnor from the George Institute for Global Health. And Dr. Jagnor is a senior research fellow and co-director for the WHO Collaborating Center for Injury Prevention, Trauma Control at the George Institute. So welcome to you, Dr. Jagnor. A professor, a doctor, and a doctor. So I'm going to get myself tangled up here. So apologies if I don't mean to cause any offense if I get this wrong. Um, we're going to have a discussion and the idea is that we're going, to, we're going to ask some questions and we're going to try and generate a little bit of energy around the discussion so that the audience can get a sense of some of the regional contexts uh, for drowning prevention. Um, so I'd like to start with you, Caroline, if that's all right. And um, I'd like to, to just acknowledge the, the contributions that you've made and many colleagues have made in the regional reports, the Western uh, Pacific Regional Report and the Southeast Asian Regional Report. And I guess my question um, to you is, what do these reports tell us about drowning and drowning prevention in the Asia Pacific area? Thanks very much, Justin. And thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today and contribute to this excellent event. Um, so yes, thank you for introducing your reports as well. I see Stacey's already put links to the reports in the chat. Uh, everyone, I highly encourage you to click on the links and download the full reports and review them at your leisure. There's a lot of fantastic information in there. Uh, I think one of the key findings from this report is really understanding the broadness of context of drowning prevention and water safety. Uh, so the Southeast Asia region, the Western Pacific region, the two have two highest drowning rates in the world. They account for 60% of the total global drowning burden. And as we started collecting data and talking to stakeholders in 30 different member states across both regions, we realized the diversity of, uh, of risk factors of, of different types of interventions available uh, for drowning prevention and water safety. So I think one of the key take home messages is whether it's traveling on water, living near water, working in or around water, so fishing, floods, other natural disasters, or bathing, these are all very important risk factors that vary between member states and between regions as well. Um, and so um, I was just reading some of the data that was flashed up on the screen. So in across the Asia Pacific, um, essentially, we're talking about a, an issue that's very heavily skewed towards drowning and drowning prevention in children. Is that a true statement? In the Southeast Asian region, yes, very much so. But in the Western Pacific region, 2019 data shows that actually the highest rates of drowning occur among older people aged 65 years and above. And, um, and Norm Farmer was, uh, was, was contacting me on the weekend. We're having a great chat on World Drowning Prevention Day. Most people would know Norm Farmer. Um, and, and so he was intrigued by the notion that the highest rates of drowning are in the Western Pacific region. Can you tell us a little bit about those very high rate, rates of drowning in, in this region? Absolutely. So a bit of background to the region itself. It's an extremely large region. It's a very diverse region. So some of the largest countries in the world and some of the smallest. So we include large countries such as China, Australia, Mongolia, but also small Pacific Island countries. So of course, there's a really big variety of how and when people interact with water across the region. In Pacific Island countries, we saw that a lot of risk factors around drowning included water transport. So small boats being used across long distances to carry families, to carry food, to carry other goods, often in sometimes quite unsafe conditions. Uh, in Mekong countries, we have so many people so close to rivers uh, to other sort of natural water bodies as well, really relying on these natural water bodies for food, for bathing, and for, uh, for drinking water. Uh, so again, the context of drowning really differs across the region. We see lots of different risk factors, but I think a lot of these factors work together to contribute to these statistics that we're seeing. Thanks very much, uh, Carolyn. I mean, it is, it is amazing, isn't it? We've had, uh, in a month or two, we've had a resolution, a World Drowning Prevention Day, two regional report status reports in the Western Pacific and the Southeast Asian region, and also uh, David uh, released some uh, technical guidelines for swim skills and daycare. So an amazing amount of drowning prevention work in just in the last couple of weeks and certainly in the last couple of days. So congratulations for your reports. We'll come back to you. But I guess having framed drowning and drowning prevention in your region, I'm really interested to go to Professor Kobasingi and ask her 
what does drowning look like? What does drowning prevention look like, in fact, in Africa? Is it the same as in Asia? We're not hearing you. Sorry, Olive. Uh, Olive, we're not hearing you. We might. Okay, so we might come back to you if you just maybe just check your microphone settings and see whether we can get that working. Are you there now? No, we heard you before. Is that better? Well, that's much better. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Good to hear you. I so the, the, <laughs> I guess if you were responding to the question, uh, Carolyn's outlined drowning and drowning prevention in Asia Pacific. And, and so the question is, um, does drowning in Africa look like drowning in Asia? No, not at all. And in fact, when I, when I first started working on drowning, a lot of the literature that I read was from Asia. And yet the patterns that we've seen uh, in Uganda, in Tanzania, in many other countries that have done studies in Africa, uh, it's markedly different. So the, the first big difference is the age, the, the, the average age of those that are drowning. Um, in, in countries around here, we tend to see older people. So in their 20s, 30s, even, um, and, and early 40s. Uh, so we have drownings in the very young children, but that's not the predominant group. Um, the context, Caroline mentioned the context, and this is really critical. Uh, in the majority of uh, drownings here, we've tended to see, especially around the lakes and rivers, uh, in the fishing communities, so the context being uh, fishing or transportation on water, so a strong occupational component. Um, and, and a number of people have mentioned the fact that uh, in the global estimates, drownings um, in the context of floods or transportation might not be included in those estimates. Here, that would leave out easily a half of the drownings um, or you know, a large component of the, of the drownings. Uh, we've also uh, tended to see, and this is really important related to making those linkages, is that in the younger children especially, this is, this is fetching water. You know, a very basic activity, fetching domestic water is a high risk for drowning. So that those that are not in the context of fishing, and transportation, the next biggest group is um, using wells, fetching water from a stream or a well. So the difference is actually quite striking, which makes it imperative that uh, for countries, to, not just here in Africa, but elsewhere, that we need local data in order to, to intervene appropriately. And, and Olive, I, so if, if, it, if drowning looks different, um, what does drowning prevention look like? How much success are you having uh, more recently in Uganda, perhaps, in responding to uh, drowning, the drowning prevention problem? Sadly, I would have to say that uh, drowning prevention is still, um, there's not a, a big push yet. We are, you know, doing advocacy and a number of groups are engaged in um, survival, you know, teaching children survival swimming, uh, maybe improving um, boat, boating safety, but we really need to be running where others are walking. When we, you know, it's, it's often said that Africa has the highest rates of drowning and, you know, now listening to the data from Southeast Asia, maybe, you know, just thinking about the sheer numbers, but I think we, we need to be doing a whole lot more and especially bringing in the various uh, sectors that are implicated. So not just thinking about um, maybe it's a transportation issue, which it is, but also it impacts fishing. It has to do with provision of water, water and sanitation, you know, which again has, is an important linkage to um, um, sustainable development goal that if we make available uh, domestic water, then we can reduce um, the rates of drowning in that, in, especially in the very young children. So I, I think that the face of drowning prevention is still not impressive. Uh, we need to work on our data and especially to understand the circumstances, the um, uh, really the, the important things that will help us to define our prevention strategies and then work on these multiple sectors so that we can begin to have 
um, to have uh, drowning prevention, uh, coherent drowning prevention. Becky talks about uh, the need for country uh, strategies and plans. And again, we see very few, I think hardly any, except for South Africa, I don't think we see other countries that have plans uh, and strategies uh, on the continent for drowning prevention. Um, thank, thank, you very, thank you very much. I think that's a good segue to, to Dr. Jagnall. We start to talk about all of the sectors uh, and the engagement with sectors that we, we need to work with. Uh, multi-sectoral action was pretty prominent in the UN resolution, and I've seen it bandied around more and more across uh, my colleagues. So, so how, how about you give us a perspective on multi-sectoral action and what it might take and what it might look like across um, a, a diverse set of contexts and regions? Yeah, thanks, Justin, and great to be here to begin with. Hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm just reflecting on Dr. Medding's Caroline and all his remarks, and it reminds me of one of my favorite authors and speakers, Jimamande Adichie, who in a very different context warns us about single story issues, not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. And I can see a lot of chat going on about floods and floods across Germany, Turkey, China, Cox Bazaar, and so on. So clearly we are all agreeing on the fact that um, drowning is diverse and its contexts are diverse. Uh, I think the issue then becomes how do we build consensus and embrace the diversity in the context, stakeholders and solutions? And uh, how do we get better at telling our story in its entirety in a unifying way? Uh, talking about multi-sectoral action, uh, it has definitely been a buzzword since UN resolution. And I think end game for all of us is seeing real reductions in drowning deaths and drowning burden, whether it's Western Pacific, Africa or Asia. And uh, we might not have set our targets yet, but to achieve that impact, we need to bring together art of political science and science of public health. And that's where I start talking about multi-sectoral action. Embed layers of intra and intrasectorality to multi-sectorality, and you have a real wicked problem on hand. Wicked not because of the degree of difficulty, but that it needs us to get out of entrenched silo thinking. And silo thinking is purposefully systemic. Um, so an acknowledgement that there is a lot beyond our control as drowning prevention enthusiasts. Uh, it would be good to have some examples buzzing in the chat room as well. I think Thailand has done some fantastic work on multi-sectoral actions and other issues. I'm sure our um, various stakeholders have achieved similar success within their own communities and on their own issues. Maybe Becky can comment how it's worked across tobacco and maternal and child health. Um, so yeah, let's keep discussing on that. It is a wicked problem. Um, well, well said, it is a wicked problem. Um, Carolyn, can you just respond to Jagnol's comments? Um, Jagnol's talking about silos and finding a home for drowning prevention versus working cross-sectoral. Um, your experience, I mean, you've, we've gone to, what, 40 governments in, in the region over the last 18 months. What's your sense of where drowning is sitting? And is it is it homogenous? Is it sitting in the same place in each country? Yeah, thanks, Justin. It's an excellent question. Uh, and as I'm sure you can anticipate the answer, it's definitely not homogenous. It definitely doesn't sit in the same place in every country. So I think a very interesting uh, finding from the reports is that each country really approaches drowning prevention in a very different way. Um, some countries, such as Australia, have these fantastic standalone water safety strategies. These strategies are inherently more perceptual. There's different roles and responsibilities for different partners and agencies and sectors. And the, the strategies really try and demonstrate how everyone should come together to, to address this one issue. However, other countries um, may choose to have drowning prevention as a key pillar and a broader injury prevention strategy, a child mm -hmm. health safety prevention strategy, uh, whereas other countries place drowning prevention in completely different sectors. It can be within disaster risk reduction or meteorology. Uh, so again, this is a very interesting learning activity because it's very, uh, again, drowning is such a broad and complex issue. And it really does depend on priorities at the national level where there is investment, where there is commitment, where there is energy at the national level, and where best then drowning can actually align or be integrated into. And that's sort of the approach that we've been investigating now moving forward as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Olive, how about you? Like, so where, 
what are the responses from these sectors that you're getting around the table? Like there's lots of energy from Uganda at the moment. There was uh, all weekend, my Twitter was buzzing with Ugandans uh, sharing uh, infographics and webinars. And I know yesterday there was a really fantastic and very well facilitated webinar uh, yesterday afternoon in Uganda. So, but the question is, what are, the, are you getting different responses from different ministries on drowning? And then I'd like you to touch, if you can, on the role of the life-saving organisations and whether they're playing a meaningful role in your efforts. Thank you, Justin. So yeah, we uh, lately we've had uh, um, very good interaction between different sectors. And this started about a year ago when we started developing um, a national water safety and drowning prevention strategy. And we were very deliberate in, in seeking out various sectors, including um, water transportation, policing, search and rescue, education, uh, health, um, and, and water and environment. And, and all these were brought together under the office of the prime minister. So it was an overarching uh, organization. And uh, some of them had never thought about drowning, didn't think it was their problem. They thought it was a fisheries problem. Some people thought it was a boating problem. They are not in boating or anything. And, and it took a while for people to begin to see that it's not any one sector's issue, that it's a, an issue that has to involve all of these sectors. So, We've had different kinds of responses with, you know, some of them taking it up enthusiastically and, and wanting to really engage with it and others being somewhat reticent and, and, and not quite engaging as much as we'd like to. But I, I think we've come a long way um, and especially under the leadership now of the water Ministry of Water and Environment, we see that there's an enthusiasm there that it's, although it's not, it would not um, initially have been in their um, mandate. Now they see it as a part of their mandate. Um, you mentioned the, um, the agencies, especially in the NGO sector, those that are in life saving. These have been actually key because they, uh, I think they're the ones that keep knocking on doors because they see people drowning. They've made attempts at, at rescue and they know they, they have a good sense of the burden, although they're not in research and they don't have hard data, but they do feel the communities and, and community um, responses to this problem. So we've had um, agencies such as uh, SwimSafe Uganda, Uganda Red Cross, uh, Life Saving, Uganda uh, Swimming Federation, you know, those that ordinarily one would not find around the table with researchers. But we've really worked well with them uh, to, to do the advocacy and, and to keep the issue in the eyes of, of the public. So, so they've been quite key in the advocacy um, area, and we would hope that you know, they stay uh, a part of this, uh, this response moving forward. Yeah, J uh, Jagna was talking about the art and the science. I think in many respects, the life-saving organizations, the swimming organizations in the field, they're sort of the heart of the issue in a sense. Um, they're certainly not going to let it go, um, but, but they certainly need to increasingly partner with a range of other actors. Um, Jagna, I'm going to bring you in now, but I think given the time, we might actually have a look at a, a really nicely produced video of some work that's going on in West Bengal with some partners. So, um, Will, if we could just play that video now and then we'll go to Jagna. তারা এই যে এই যে বন্যা হয়েছে চারিদিকে তো জল ভর্তি তারা জলে ডুবে মারা যাচ্ছে কিন্তু আমাদের সরকারের থেকে কোনো ব্যবস্থাপনা নেওয়া হচ্ছে না আমরা চাই সেই শিশুদের বাঁচাতে রোজ প্রথম কাজ যে পুরো যাদের বাড়িতে শিশু আছে তাদের আশেপাশের পুকুরগুলোকে ঘিরতে হবে এবং তাদের মা বাবারা যখন বাইরে কাজে যাবে তখন তাদের জন্য একটা একটা ঘর ছোট মতন ঘর বানানো হবে যেটা তাদের মা বাবার কাজে গেলে সেইখানে থাকার ব্যবস্থা করা হবে শিশুদের তাদের খাবার জল এবং আমি আমরা এটা মনে করি যে বড় রা যারা আঠেরো বছরের ঊর্ধ্বে তারা ভোট দেয় বলে কি তাদের সরকারের প্রতি বেশি গুরুত্ব সরকার কি তাদের বেশি গুরুত্ব দেয় এই জন্যই বাচ্চাদেরকে কোনো গুরুত্ব নেই তারা ভোট দেয় না উঠে না আমরা এটা নিয়ে প্রচণ্ড প্রতিবাদ জানাচ্ছি যে আমাদের শিশুরা যাতে জলের ডোবা থেকে বাঁচতে পারে এবং তার জন্য যা ব্যবস্থা নয় তাই সরকারের কাছে আবেদন করছে যেন তারা সেই ব্যবস্থাগুলো নেয় নমস্কার সাঁতার কাটা একটি জীবনদায়ী দক্ষতা আমি পারি 
তোমরা পারবে তো I, uh, I think you always win the internet with children, right? I think that video was very nicely produced. But if you kind of contemplate um, the video and the message of the children, um, the question for, for you, Jagnor, is um, in, in drowning prevention, um, uh, Dr. Carolyn and Dr. Olive have been talking about stakeholders and policymakers, and Becky was talking about government. I guess the question is who matters most in this? And is it actually people in the field? Yes, absolutely. Communities and the children who, who are at the brunt of it. So out of 600, if you truly acknowledge that at least 230 children per day are dying due to drowning, so they are at the heart of it. But before I respond to your question, I would like to give full credit um, to the community and Sini for bringing these young costumes together. I am sure Sini is somewhere there on the webinar, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, and also giving a bit of a background who these kids are. So you can see them wearing masks and what a resilient community to have been through COVID, uh, not being in school for the last 18 months and they do not have the luxury and the privilege of internet or homeschooling. Um, and recently been through floods as well. Um, so if the audience does not know, this is the Eastern state of West Bengal and specifically the Sundarbans area. It is the land of uh, Nobel laureate Ravindranath Tagore and was home to Mother Teresa. I saw Caroline smile when we were playing the video, so I'm sure she's having a bit of, a bit of nostalgia. And I think Becky has been there as well, so she might be thinking about it too. Um, and, uh, and it is all of that, but these are also the communities with the highest reported child drowning deaths. These are three times higher than those in Bangladesh. And I think the data also highlights the need for local data. So if you're talking about the entire India, India is many countries in one country, and you can say it contributes 19 to 20% of global drowning deaths. Um, but what it is really, so it can be river drowning, it can be flood drowning, it can be coastal drowning, but as we see over here, it is very much child drowning and the context is very similar to Bangladesh. Here, I would also like to really thank RNLI for giving us the opportunity to do some of the formative work and get um, this going. Now, knowing these numbers, how do you not act? And I think what uh, Caroline and Becky and Gemma and everyone else have been kind of hinting towards is co-designing, co-designing implementation strategies with the communities, acknowledging that these interventions would probably look different in everywhere we work in. And it's simply because their contexts are different. And also thinking about who benefits. So Olive was mentioning about having safe access to water, so piped water. And when we talk about co-benefits, it's, it's thinking about the upstream and the midstream factors. And one of the interesting things, for example, when we think about wash, uh, piped water and sanitation is also violence prevention. And it's a big issue in India with respect to gender violence prevention. Um, I think there was a fair bit of chat about uh, how do we get governments involved? And to that, we think um, having prospective policy analysis, so looking at various potential sectors and programs that are already in place and not creating parallel systems. So that is action research for evidence-informed policies um, for governments to allocate resources appropriately. Uh, and that's I what I think brings sustainability. And I think that relates very well to Becky's point on how do we get governments engaged by uh, bringing them in right from the beginning, but also giving them enough to hook on to. Um, as an academic, I think I can keep going for a bit, and, but I'm mindful, and I'm sure you're also looking at the timer. So I hope we can keep engaging over chat, Twitter, or mail, or call. Um, thank you. I think, thanks very much, Jagnal. Um, Carolyn, you've, you've obviously spent a, time, a bit of time in the region, but um, I guess that just in terms of wrapping this session up, I just want to ask you what, what do you think the most important things that we need to do as a cohesive sector in the next um, coming years to, to be successful and maximise the opportunity of the UN resolution? Yeah, thanks, Justin. And I think this sort of touches on what Jagner has just discussed, but it's really uh, always really eye-opening through the work that we've just completed with the amount of fantastic innovative drought range interventions already happening in community settings across both regions, uh, led by different sectors, by different partners, by different stakeholders. But 
if you take this national consultation process and sit down with various, uh, various individuals working passionate about this issue, you really start to unearth and uncover some fantastic interventions and strategies. So I think a very important thing moving forward is to document and share these and try and realize their transferability and their upscale because a lot is being done. Uh, there should be some more efforts around perhaps coordination and alignment, and making sure there are no overlaps or gaps, but it's very important to understand what solutions communities have already identified and are taking uh, and then be able to, again, share an upscale. Okay, I think that's a pitch for more regional status reports, I think. Uh, I, see them, I see them in your future, John Passmore and a few others, perhaps. Um, <laughs> uh, Professor Olive, and you, what do you think the, the sorts of things we really must do in the next couple of years to maximise this opportunity? Uh, thank you, Justin. So, yeah, so while we don't have the luxury of doing just one thing at a time and we need to do a number of things all at once, strategies and, and building multisectoral collaborations and I think we need to really in Africa work on our data. We need to understand the magnitude. We also need to especially understand the risk factors so that we can both intervene appropriately, but also be able to, to track progress and see if we are making, you know, if we are saving more lives, if we uh, have, you know, so even if we have process indicators and we don't necessarily wait to see whether less, fewer people are drowning, we do need to set targets and we cannot set targets unless we have data. And a lot of countries don't have any data, don't know how many people are drowning, where they are drowning, why they're drowning. These are really basic to our understanding of drowning prevention. So I think we need to, while working on strategies on multism, we do need to work on our data. We need to improve our understanding of both the magnitude and the risk factors, the circumstances around drowning in the region. Thanks, uh, thanks, Professor Olive. And Jagno, just some final words from you. Oh, wow, lucky me. I do get some final words. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Um, uh, well, final words from me. I, I was thinking about that we have talked about sectors and governments. A call for action for everyone within the audience would be perhaps um, a starting point. Um, look around you, look around in your stratosphere and think who the person from another discipline, uh, another sector might be who would you like to invite for uh, celebrating uh, World Running Prevention Day 2022. Um, Justin, I don't know if I have enough time or not, but I think one of the favorite topics that you have often mentioned is the Global Drowning Prevention Partnership, and would have loved to hear about it if you have time. However, since you have given me the mic, I would make, like to make another pitch to it. Um, I would hope the champions and leaders within the drowning prevention community um, take forward the critical lessons from other global partnerships and ensure inclusive, equitable partnerships that are transparent and agile enough to course correct. Um, so yeah, with that, I will hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jagnol. Good pitch, but we don't have time to get into the global partnership, but thank you very much for the opportunity. You're trying to reverse the interview process. I know exactly what you're doing. Um, <laughs> I'm going to cop out of that and we'll talk separately on that, I think. Um, but the time is up for this session. I Look, it's been a wonderful opportunity to talk to the three of you. So I'd like to, to thank um, Professor Olive. Thank you very much for your valuable time and joining us, Olive. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Dr. Carolyn. Thank you very much. Keep doing good, great things in the region. Thanks so much, Justin. Thanks. And thanks, Dr. Diagonal. We'll talk very, very soon. Um, and so with that, we're going to go to the next part of the, uh, the webinar. We're going to pick up the pace um, uh, again, and we're going to start celebrating with a lot of excitement um, and reflecting on the national and local commemorations that have been taking place over the last couple of days. Um, very, very exciting. And we've got four or five or six or seven, actually, it grew quite rapidly this afternoon. So we've got a range of new panellists that will help us through this section. Um, and so give them lots of encouragement in the chat because um, they've been busy for the last 48 hours since the World Drowning Prevention Day, collecting all wonderful content, as much content as possible as we can show in slides uh, with you to give you a sense of all the, the great activity that's been going on. So the first speaker in this section is a very good friend and someone who's worked really tirelessly, particularly over the last month or so to help organize the World Drowning Prevention Day. So I'd like to introduce Roger Sweeney. Roger is the Deputy CEO and Marketing Manager with Water Safety Island. Welcome, Roger. 
Hi, Justin, and hello to everybody. It's lovely to be with you all. Can you hear me? Yeah, we certainly can hear you, but we want you to explain. Um, you came up with the idea of going blue for World Drowning Prevention Day. So why don't you walk us through that? The, the, the initiative, Justin, actually originated through two channels. Uh, firstly, in conversation with our friends at the RNLI who came up with the idea of reaching out to their own contacts to uh, light up in blue. And so we worked together to bring on board the heritage sites, the government buildings and the landmarks in the UK and in Ireland. And secondly, literally in the days leading up to World Round Prevention Day, I just thought it would be a nice to, way to engage not just the landmarks in Ireland, but, but people as well, to ask the lifeguards to face paint a blue line on their cheeks, or as one child called it, a cheeky blue smile, and something that would visually engage people online and at our lifeguarded waterways. And then it was just a matter of asking the public uh, to do the same. And in, in Ireland, you often hear parents saying to a child, I'm blue in the face, telling you to be careful. Now they were literally going blue, but with uh, good reason and having fun uh, doing so. And, and, and going blue took off. Uh, it was embraced across the entire island of Ireland and in Scotland and the UK. And in Ireland, in, in addition to the blue buildings and the public and lifeguard face paint, uh, frontline emergency services were doing it too, uh, such as the Coast Guard and RNLI, the Fire Service, the National Ambulance Service, the Irish Police Force called the Garda Síochána, local authorities and others. It, it really was a multi-agency engagement and it saw blue buildings and blue smiles uh, ac across many services, Justin. So uh, people seem to appreciate, I think, the, the opportunity to make water safety part of their personal uh, conversation. It wasn't a safety message that they had to listen to. Uh, this was a message that they could create and, and spread online in an, in an engaging way. And also talk about water safety in person with loved ones um, as they passed a blue building or posted a water safety message with, with a photo. And that's what we wanted uh, for people to make water safety part of the conversation they are having with loved ones and sharing messages uh, that can prevent drowning. And uh, on the subject of drowning, um, uh, sadly, the, 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 the day itself actually coincided with a spate of summer drownings across the island of Ireland and in the UK. So as the day unfolded, we saw all agencies as busy with uh, broadcast media as they were on social media. And what really came across was the commonality of our messaging, uh, the shared ownership of our safety messages was really obvious. And in terms of that shared messaging, uh, certainly in the UK, there has been an emerging commonality across the agencies to respect the water, for example. And in Ireland, we also have common messaging such as together, let's bring drownings down or know what you're getting into or better safe than sorry, that we add to water safety messaging throughout the year to target specific at-risk groups. And also in Ireland, as, as the day loomed very quickly, I might, I might uh, we built videos and shareable water safety content onto a dedicated website and onto social media channels, which included the support of a number of government ministers or Taoiseach or Prime Minister, um, and indeed the President of Ireland, uh, which gave our day-to-day -day messaging and our strategic priorities accessibility, if you like, uh, with other stakeholders uh, well after the day itself. Um, and in the UK, the National Water Safety Forum and Water Safety Scotland did a, a great job ensuring that their website had a dedicated page for the day, drawing on WHO material uh, to make common assets available to all members. So in securing, I suppose, this resolution and the build up to World Drowning Prevention Day, it's starting to create more space there for strategic collaboration and conversations across government departments where gaps are identified. And, and as important as it is, uh, to have cross-departmental and joint agency collaborations. There are families with personal stories that have as important a story to tell. And there's power for change in those uh, personal stories, especially when they're delivered by the family to decision makers at the highest level. And this occurred during World Drowning Prevention Day. I think immediately of Becky uh, Ramsey in the UK who lost her 13 year old boy and is championing uh, doing it for Dylan. And in Ireland of Amanda Cambridge who lost her three year old boy Avery and has been an ambassador for Water Safety Ireland's new preschool resources uh, called Hold Hands uh, launched by two 
government ministers only last month. And of course, remembering loved ones is the intention of World Drowning Prevention Day, one of them. And, and it can be a day that gives strength and courage to families like Becky uh, and Amanda, wishing to share their stories and talk about what can be done uh, to avoid similar tragedies. And it's their stories and their commitment that are having influence for example, in the UK through the power of petitions and advocating parliamentarians and other sectors, really turning tragedy into positive action. We certainly saw it with Amanda in Ireland through the Hold Hands campaign. Um, and uh, people can see our preschool resources on www.holdhands.ie. But just to finish, Justin, uh, last year, um, we had the lowest number of drownings uh, for 85 years in Ireland. And we're now three years into our government's 10-year national drowning prevention strategy, which has five pillars, but uh, one of those uh, prioritizes partnerships, and we're all talking about that importance at the moment. Uh, but I think, uh, personally, um, just to finish in, 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 in terms of partnering and raising awareness about water safety, I'd, I'd like to think that um, the Going Blue initiative that you're looking at here will be to Water Drowning Prevention Day, what Going Green is to uh, St. Patrick's Day in due course. So quite exciting to wonder what initiatives will come forth through all of us um, here on this webinar at the moment. And we have 50 weeks to think about it. Well, there's a challenge, uh, Roger. Listen, I, I'd also like to thank you. And I'd like to thank all of Ireland, actually, because often we focus on the role of Bangladesh in the UN resolution. But as, as I understand, Ireland it were certainly instrumental uh, to many of the negotiations and the support for the process. And I know in the background, you and John and others were actively uh, supporting your government in that process. So you've certainly made the most of World Drowning Prevention Day. And so we congratulate you and, and thank you uh, for, for all of that effort. Thank you for that, Justin. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Let's go to our, our next speaker. Um, and our next speaker is a... a Our next speaker is a very dear friend and, and colleague of all of us, Dr. Anna Katerina Roger. And Anna is, sorry, Katerina is um, at the University of Porto. She's also the co-founder of uh, the International Drowning Research Alliance, and she's a member of the ILS Drowning Prevention Commission. Uh, so welcome, Katerina. Hi, everyone. Dr. Katerina. <laughs> we, woke you, we woke you up this morning in a fright about your slides, and so I do apologise. Um, and, and we're really interested. I've asked you to have a look at, um, at Portugal and Europe and then, then look a little bit closely at Africa as well. Can you take us through some of the ways that colleagues and friends in those areas have been celebrating World Drowning Prevention Day? Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Justin and Tim, for assisting in, in pulling up this presentation with an overview of the, the several key activities that took place in Europe and, and Africa. And despite the current restrictions uh, in place across the regions uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic and, and the recent devastating flooding that happened in Europe, the regions woke up uh, on Sunday highly motivated and excited to celebrate the World Drowning Prevention Day. The digital presence was the preferred way to convey messages with activities such as webinars, social media posts and press releases being spread all across locals, nations and, and the regions. Uh, but many countries uh, have also organized in-person activities, mainly at beaches and, and marinas. Uh, in Europe, the International Life Saving Federation produced and, and released several documents, including a list of European designated bathing areas, uh, with reference to how many of them are supervised by lifeguards, a press release, a video message from the president, and a letter sent to about 15 media officers of the European Union key bodies. Uh, it has also cooperated with WHO Europe in the preparation for regional activities and um, has published several posts on social media with key drowning prevention messages as well as cues for actions uh, for lay people. In Portugal, where I came from, uh, many organizations uh, celebrated the day at the beach with ocean literacy activities targeting kids and beachgoers. Uh, the Maritime, uh, the National Maritime Authority um, all the surf and rescue activity, as NASA Portugal, all the webinar and liaised with African Portuguese speaking countries to re-engage in their drowning prevention activities. And the motivation was such in Portugal uh, that one uh, NGO even had a plane 
uh, flying over with a, a commemorative banner. <laughs> uh, that's, wow. that, that, that was awesome, actually. <laughs> Uh, many other European countries run several in-person activities at local and national levels. Um, examples coming from Spain, Norway, Finland, uh, Germany, UK, Greece, Italy, Serbia, Ireland, many others included um, a distribution, distribution of pamphlets, running rescue simulations, workshops and water safety and life-saving courses for children. Uh, participating in podcasts and um, AMA sessions. And actually there were a couple of countries that uh, worked hard and, and take the, the opportunity uh, of the World Drowning Prevention Day to issue some pleas for local decision makers to allocate more resources for swimming and water safety education to be uh, headed to the national curriculum. Uh, the International Drowning Researchers Alliance has also released 22 one-minute videos with members raising awareness of research gaps and opportunities for the future of drowning prevention. Um, we have also seen from Europe uh, images of lifeguards providing crucial help and support in their communities after the devastating floods uh, that uh, hit parts of Europe just a few days before the World Drowning Prevention Day. And this event, is, uh, of course, added some sadness to the celebrations, but also they highlighted um, how there's still a lot of work to do, even in high income countries, regarding coordination and planning in the context of disaster risk reduction and climate change, uh, where these events will become more common. And in understanding how, how drowning prevention uh, will fit in, in those agendas. Um, in Africa, we, we have also seen uh, an abundant digital presence with numerous uh, uh, videos and posts being shared, as well as num numerous uh, in-person activities and even high-level activities involving key uh, stakeholders, um, uh, especially highlighting how markedly different, and as Olive has mentioned before, uh, drowning is in this region with a strong occupational component for drowning risk. Uh, Life Saving uh, South Africa celebrated the vigilance and service uh, of some heroes that performed rescues on and off duty. Uh, also, the NSRI has marked the occasion with a display of over 200 pink rescue boys in Cape Town and handing awards uh, to three brave men that uh, recently saved the life using one of those uh, pink rescue boys available for uh, bystanders. Uh, in Tanzania, a, a marine, a marine uh, stakeholder uh, task team was formed and in, an event to call to end of drowning was held with 200 participants across ministries, NGOs, uh, CSOs, municipal and local government, and the national director of fisheries. Uh, in Zanzibar, the Milel Foundation and PNG Project organized an online event, and the second vice president office highlighted the need for a multi-sectoral approach uh, to drowning prevention. And there were also demonstrations of best practice for survival swimming, um, several ministers, including education, health, maritime, fisheries, and disaster management, uh, explained how their ministries are working towards downing prevention. Also, the Ugandan uh, webinar uh, held yesterday uh, highlighted the need for multi-sectoral collaboration and had contributions from Marine Police, uh, Ministry of Water and Environment, Ministry of Works and Transport, and uh, also a representative of a fishing community. Uh, other countries such as Lesotho, Ghana, Cameroon, Morocco, and many others have also appeared on numerous activities, mainly uh, online activities, uh, including phone, uh, uh, radio phone-in show and uh, demonstrations of survival swimming and media posts, all conveying uh, the motto, Africa united to stop drowning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Katarina. And I should also acknowledge Becky Sindel for, for pulling together some, you know, some images and, and contributing you. to yes. that presentation. Thanks very much, uh, Katarina. Have a great day. Thank you very much. We're going to go Thank to you. our next speaker now. Um, our next speaker uh, comes all the way from Brazil, the gold medalist in surfing, well, the country of gold medalists in surfing, Dr. David Spielman. Uh, Dr. Spielman is the medical director for Sabrasa and also an IDRA co-founder and pretty instrumental in the ILS Medical uh, Commission. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Spielman. 
Hello, Justin. Dr. Spinner is not here right now. Can I replace him? I'm you keen. Can. Yeah, I'm keen. I, I talk with the children about drowning prevention in pools, beaches, uh, rivers, and so ever. So what I, what I want to say is uh, <laughs> we, we really knew, do need, as uh, Professor Oliver said, we do need a special message to our public. So we do need to know our public before. And the World Drowning Prevention Day is not about the day, but about a lot of preparation before the day. The day is coming to actions. And then we have to do afterwards a reevaluation of what we did, what we have uh, uh, hoping for the future. And the main, the main uh, message is re to reduce drowning. But to do that, we need uh, as a plan, as a strategic plan, to gather all the Latin Americans. So South, uh, South America, Central America, and Mexico, and get all together to, like, as a, we speak Portuguese and Spanish, it's easier to, to, to spread the message. So what we did exactly, it was to prepare those, those uh, tools, those tools for it to use on the on 25 day, on the World Drowning Prevention Day. So we started at May, working with meetings and then we we start to raise awareness of the problem doing uh, some uh, post every day with regional uh, data with uh, raising the problem of drowning and then when uh, when we stop at uh, june 25 they are able to to look at the website and see what exactly message is customized to their problem on regional issue. And we also ran a competition of the, the best video, one minute video, the best phrase for World Drowning Prevention Day and the best mascot. And this runs very well at the web, at the Facebook, they put it, put it in, we give them a prize and we come up with very good videos, very good phrases and more for mas mascot for ourselves. We do believe that using mascots is uh, the way you get through the message to the, our main public, which is children. And the message need to be simple. Drowning is a complex uh, disease. And uh, we do not have a simple solution. So we need to understand the public to give exactly the right message so we can impact them as, 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 uh, for, for a life long. And then for a wrap, wrapping up, we did a webinar, which is on, on, on the screen, uh, which involve uh, 27 states in Brazil. Brazil has 20, uh, 200 million people. Uh, we, we are able to involve tw the 27 states and more four count Latin countries, which is uh, uh, Mexi uh, I'm sorry, Argentina, Spain, Portugal, and Uruguay. So what we, we achieved was uh, a, a, a very good uh, feedback from all of people, or from all of uh, our two, 200,000 followers at the, the, the social media. And then to wrap up all of this message, we're gonna meet all together again in a few days to understand our gaps, our errors, and uh, how can we improve this for the future? And uh, also we get, by this night, we are, we are able to do a 40 minutes program on drowning prevention on CNN. So this will spread a lot of the message of World Drowning Prevention Day. Thank you, Justin. Thanks very much, Dr. Spielman. Um, I did say have fun, no crabs, and you've surprised me with a mask. So I think we've been all entertained I'm, by that. And I'm sorry, but I think <laughs> the message is very simple. We need to yeah. deliver a ludic message to the, the, the 
our public, which is children. Yeah, it was very well done. Thank you very much, David. Um, have a good day. Let's move to our next speaker. Uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Amy Pedden. Amy is a lecturer and researcher in University of New South Wales, Sydney, and also uh, an honorary senior research fellow with the Royal Life Saving Society of Australia. Welcome, Amy. Hi. And you're going to take us through some activities a little bit closer to my home and, and a few others. So away you go. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, I apologize. There was so much activity on social media. I absolutely could not keep up, even though I was glued to Twitter. So this is a... Uh, a selection, I guess. Um, we saw some great video content. Um, on the screen now are some examples from Royal Life Saving um, and Surf Life Saving in Australia, uh, really reflecting, I guess, Royal Life Saving on uh, everyday actions that people can take to reduce drowning risk um, and Surf Life Saving really looking at the risk factors and, and preventative actions that Surf Life Saving undertake and encouraging everyone to be safe at the beach. So uh, encourage people to check this out and keep sharing them. They're still on Twitter as well. We might go to the next slide if we can. Um, we also saw some really uh, great posts on social media as well. Here are some more tweets. Um, great to see organisations jumping on the Olympics uh, and getting some athletes to speak to the issue. Um, it's a good timing this year. It might not happen every four years, but it's good to try and uh, link in with the Olympics. And we saw some um, WHO regional offices as well sharing content, uh, including safety tips. And a couple of organisations also did a countdown in the lead up. So that was pretty fabulous as well. Um, there's also quite powerful uh, advocacy going on through the written word. We saw some, uh, this piece now on the screen, looking at the, the links between drowning and climate, as a few of us have started to discuss. Um, we really, I guess, need to harness those links better. And, and when we talk about multi-sectoral action, that's a really important part. We've also had some pretty powerful uh, pieces in The Lancet, which are going up there on the screen now, and I encourage you all to check those out. Um, and we've also had some other advocacy pieces from around the world. Um, Professor Richard Franklin and I talked about the full burden of drowning, the importance that data reflects that, and that's been a key theme that we've been discussing. Uh, we've seen great pieces from uh, Professor Mike Tipton, looking at the physiology of drowning, Amina Rahman from Bangladesh, um, and also some other journalists taking up the challenge, including a piece from Nepal. And I think we're going to hear a little bit more about that later. Um, we've also seen some really great um, video assets. And now we're going to turn to focus to the Middle East. This is from the Kuwait Fire Service. Um, and I noticed that uh, Dawn Whitaker is, is on the call. She's put a message in the chat about working towards uh, gaining traction and, uh, you know, better collaboration with fire services around the world before 2022. So I'd encourage you to scroll up in the chat and find her email and uh, we can all work better to engage that sector more in drowning prevention in the future. We've also seen some really great, uh, next slide please. We've also seen some really cool presentations on uh, uh, social media assets, I guess, about uh, rescue techniques as well from the Middle East. So some tweets there. And, and also some demonstrations. We've seen uh, there's rescue tubes and uh, throw lines as well, which are coming up now. Um, and these examples are from Iran. So yeah, definitely not an exhaustive list. There's a lot going on. Um, there's been some webinars as well. David mentioned one, we ran one as well. Um, there's a great one coming up with the George Institute uh, tomorrow night, Australian time. So less, slightly less than 24 hours from now um, with Medhavi Gupta looking at their work in India. So I'd encourage people to, to have a look and register for that as well. Um, but thanks for the opportunity, Justin. Fantastic, Amy. Thanks, thanks very much. Really comprehensive review of, uh, of work in the region. And congratulations to you and um, Professor Richard Franklin. Uh, we can say Professor now um, on, on your piece in injury prevention. It was really interesting to read as well. Um, we're going to go, know, we, we, we seconded some people very, very late in the planning process. And so we, we just thought it would be good to actually get, have some vignettes from, 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 from some very significant countries in our journey. And so I'd like to, to introduce uh, Bhagavati Sudan from Nepal. She's a lecturer um, in Nepal in population studies and a fairly active researcher. And I'd like to invite her to the panel now, if we could. Welcome, Bhagavati. Hi, Dustin. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. Thank you for joining us. Tell us a little bit about, uh, about how you celebrate or commemorated World Drowning Prevention Day. First of all, a big thank you to organizer for giving me opportunity 
uh, to share about the drowning prevention activities in Nepal and about share about my uh, drowning article, which was published in National Daily in um, Kanthipur. It was published in 25th July. As in uh, other countries, drowning is a serious public health problem in Nepal. A recent uh, regional status report showed that uh, around 1600, pe 1,600 people died from drowning each year, um, which is uh, relatively high for such a small population. I can say that drowning prevention activities are, it's sad to say that almost not existence in Nepal. UN regulations and drowning prevention activities very relevant for us to bring the issue of drowning to the government and related agency and the com communities. The shared of evidence uh, speak like loudly. So in this uh, article, it is uh, written in Nepali. I've tried to provide possible evidences of drowning in Nepal and also highlighted how, where we are lacking for drowning prevention and how the world is combating for drowning prevention and what we can do to prevent drowning in Nepal. Further, in my article, I expressed that we can, even we are not uh, uh, doing some driving, drowning prevention activities. So I express in my article that we can start drowning prevention through generating evidence um, uh, through um, uh, the different research activities. So on this day, I want to share one thing is that uh, my article is published. Uh, this uh, uh, the article there was two article two, two issue in one paper, in one page, and it was published along with the ex uh, vice chairman of our national planning commission. So this article shared number of times in social media. That I'm so happy that the drowning issue also reached to the large population. Thank you, Justin. Fantastic, Bhagavati. Thank you very much for your energy and enthusiasm and your work in Nepal. Um, and, and goodbye. Thank you for joining us. Our next speaker um, is uh, someone who's flown in all the way from Bangkok. Um, she's well known across the drowning prevention community. She um, does a fantastic job. So uh, welcome, Sushada Gemongkong. Um, welcome. You are um, obviously at the Ministry of Public Health, where you lead the drowning prevention efforts in Thailand. How about you tell us a little bit about how uh, the day was commemorated in Thailand by your team? Um, thank you, Justin Scar, and good, uh, good evening from uh, Thailand about your commemorate world drowning prevention in Thailand. We invite all the network to take part in the World Drowning Prevention Day. We celebrate by photographing drowning prevention activities and embedding the World Drowning Prevention Day logo and hashtag drowning prevention and share the world via the social media platforms. Uh, the campaign has the main goal of blessing awareness of the July 25 uh, as the World Drowning Prevention Day. After that, uh, the, uh, the Department of Disease Control uh, we will select 25 image and uh, reward those with the souvenirs. Uh, the souvenirs will be engraved in Thai language, which means uh, now no more. Uh, and we also set our goal that next year and every year, our World Drowning Prevention Day, we will celebrate by collaborate with Manti Dispensary agencies to organize a campaign and national drowning prevention emergency maker forum to, uh, to present an award from the prime minister to our emergency maker team that has been accredited to prevent drowning at the national level and agencies or personnel who have outstanding performance in drowning prevention uh, finally, I would like to thank World Health Organization, uh, Royal National Life Board, Royal Life Saving Society Australia for uh, reference and establish the World Drowning Prevention Ray. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Sushana. It's always inspiring to see your work in Thailand and I pass on my congratulations to all of your, your Merit Maker teams. Thank you. Um, we're gonna go now to a surprise guest. Um, he was uh, uh, seconded into our panel just very late. Um, he's appearing in video, but I think we've actually got him on a panel. So uh, Dr. Amina Rahman. Uh, Dr. Amina Rahman is the Director of the International Drowning Research Center in Bangladesh at the Center for Injury Prevention. And, uh, Dr. Amin is a tireless worker in this field. Have we got Dr. Amin appearing anywhere other than in the video on a TV on the screen? No? Oh, here he is. Hello. Hello. Dr. Rahman, thank you for joining us. Can you, um, obviously there's lots of people on this uh, webinar who are familiar with you and your work and inspired by it, but can you share just a little bit about how uh, Bangladesh approached World Drowning Prevention Day? Okay, this World Pro uh, Drowning Prevention Day is uh, special uh, for Bangladesh, in, uh, at least in two aspects. One, you know, uh, this is the country where uh, the leading cause of under 18 children after infancy death is, is drowning. And secondly, the, the even ambassador of uh, Bangladesh actually proposed uh, with, uh, along with the uh, even ambassador of Ireland, uh, this resolution. So th these are very, very uh, significant for, for as a Bangladeshi. And as I, I, I work for the drowning prevention for the long time. Uh, uh, actually, it was just after the Eid vacation uh, on the 25th and, and we are uh, in a lockdown situation. So whatever we had to do, we, we, we did um, um, uh, virtually. Um, on the 25th, um, a lot of articles and reports actually published uh, in uh, daily newspapers. And uh, there are a couple of TV channels organized um, talk shows uh, by involving the me member of parliaments, the uh, line director, non-communicable disease of DGHS under the Minister of Health. Uh, I was also present in one of the talk shows and then our, our main mm, uh, event will occur tomorrow, the 29th. So this is a national program. And I'm proud to say that the, uh, the non-communicable disease control director of Director General of Health Services uh, leading this program. And we all, the drowning prevention uh, organizations, including um, WHO, UNICEF, CIPRB, Synergos, uh, and also Global Health Advocacy Incubator, and other, other actors, uh, at drowning prevention activists, together actually organizing this program. And our two ministers, uh, Minister of Health and Family Welfare, and the State Minister of uh, Women and Children Affairs are going to the um, chief guest and the uh, special guest, respectively. And we are expecting uh, about uh, 800 to 1,000 uh, to join uh, in the virtual meeting through uh, Zoom platform. And uh, all the um, health related uh, health officials uh, from national level down to the sub district level will, will, be, will be joined and also other relevant um, people from the different ministries, uh, uh, different NGOs uh, are going to, to, to participate in that program. And actually we are looking forward to tomorrow's program. Thank you, Justin. Fantastic, a thousand people um, in a program on drowning prevention in Bangladesh sounds like a, a great uh, achievement and a great acknowledgement of the day. Um, listen, uh, I mean, pass on our thanks to you, uh, to all of your team, including all of those wonderful people out working in the field uh, today um, uh, on drowning prevention. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. That brings us to the conclusion of uh, the webinar. We're pretty much almost on time. Um, there's a few people that I would like to acknowledge. Um, I would certainly like to acknowledge the planning uh, committee that helped uh, with the webinar. That planning committee included uh, Dr. David Meddings, it included Gemma May, uh, Kate Eardley, uh, Roger Sweeney, who provides some guidance. And so I'd like to thank them for their contributions to 
uh, the program and the program design for this webinar. Um, I'd also like to thank the people who have been working really hard behind the scenes to help this make it make sorry to help make this happen technically. Uh, Monique Sharp, the event manager of Royal Life Saving, that Chris Gronerman, the IT uh, manager, uh, Alex McGregor, the, the digital manager, and also Will uh, Coon, William Coon, who's uh, been seconded today to help us with this webinar uh, technically, and he certainly worked tirelessly today. Uh, helping build the, the wonderful PowerPoint presentation that got us through particularly that last section. So I'd like to particularly acknowledge uh, all four of those people for helping us uh, through. And I'd like to thank you. There were about 450 people registered. I think at our peak, we might have had 250 people participating. I do hope that you've enjoyed um, this acknowledgement of the um, the World Drowning Prevention Day and also the UN resolution. I know some of you are probably a little bit disappointed that you weren't also invited to speak. Um, there were some ambitious ideas very early on to do a 24 hour webinar on World Drowning Prevention Day. And I kind of think we could fill 24 hours of wonderful drowning prevention content. Um, so I appreciate all of the, the wonderful feedback in the chat. Um, I'd like to thank you all. And I'd like to uh, throw out uh, some of those challenges that, uh, that Roger made in terms of we've got about 51 weeks to plan World Drowning Prevention Day, July 25, 2022. And I'd certainly encourage you to, to make the most of it locally, make the most of it nationally and collaborate globally. And together we can make this really significant. So I wish you all the best and thank you very much.